Thank you, Jesus. Right, so this morning, Palisa and I are going to be tag teaming. Yay! How exciting is that? Amen. Thank you. No, thank you for the enthusiasm. Not for me, right, but for the word. Yeah. You're hungry for the word. Amen. Amen. You're hungry to receive of the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, if you remember, we were doing the series on the seven spirits of God. Remember that? Yes. We were doing our series on the seven spirits of God. Can I get Isaiah 11 to very quickly, please? While that is happening, I've been reminded by Pastor Liesl to welcome our onlineers. So onlineers, welcome. Bianca, if you're watching from China, hello today. God bless you. And to all the other people who watch this on replay or are going to join us live, thank you for joining us. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Right, can I get Isaiah 11 to up or we up? Right. So today we're coming to conclusion, our series of the seven spirits of God. And these are the seven spirits, right? The spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen. The spirit of wisdom. Yes. Spirit of understanding. Yes. The spirit of counsel. Spirit of power. Which means today we're going to do two, right? We're going to do the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So you're going to be very busy and the teacher's with me today. So you're going to be taught. You're going to be preached at. You're going to be whatever at right. Amen. Amen. I'm going to briefly start with an introduction to the spirit of knowledge before I give over to Palisa. And in your listening to this, in your listening to this, teaching on the spirit of knowledge. I want to ask you one question that I'm going to give over to her, right? How much of our walk as believers is defined by our gifts? Or how much of our walk as believers is defined by our spiritual knowledge or our knowledge of the spirit? Think carefully. Or oh, let me rephrase, let me make it personal. How much of your life as a believer do you define by your gifts? I've got a gift of wisdom. I've got a gift of prophecy. I've got a gift of help. I've got a gift of this. I've got a gift of that. And how much of your walk is defined by the knowledge of the Lord? Are we together? And that's where I'm stopping. Over to you. Amen. 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 Um, let me start with definitions of what, um, what these two words or phrases mean. The knowledge and the spirit, uh, or the fear of the, of the spirit of God, of the Lord. So knowledge is, um, I looked it up, it's, it's a comprehension, it's an awareness of something or a subject, and it's facts, it's information that you have, or it's skills that you've acquired, either through learning or through experience, uh, either with your hands or something that you know, or it's a familiarity of a subject or something in question that we're talking about. So I looked up um, from a, some Proverbs 1 7. If you have your Bibles, please just go there. Right, are we all there? Yes, amen. All right. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So do you see how they are connected? But then it goes actually a little bit further because with, with Isaiah 11, it's, it speaks about the seven spirits of God, right? So now how are these all connected to each other? How do we as believers, you know, uh, get to experience or, or live out uh, these seven spirits of God. So I found the answer in Colossians chapter 1. Please just turn to Colossians chapter 1. And underline these and make notes in your Bible. I just want to see pens moving and stuff clicking, and, you know. Let's see. Colossians is, is in the New Testament. After those eight, put into chips. After Philippians, 
That's how I remember. Girls is Galatians. Girls eat potato chips. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Hey, what? <laughs> 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 because I can see the under 20s. They're just all looking nervous. Girls eat potato, okay, maybe chips, yeah, Colossians. Okay, so you know where to find, how to find what from now on. All right, uh, chapter one, verse nine. Are we all there? And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Uh, they heard what? Let's just go back to verse 8. And he has made, made known to us your love in the Spirit. So, and so from the day we heard, we heard about your love in the Spirit. We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. That's one. No? In all spiritual wisdom, we covered wisdom, right? And understanding, we did understanding, right? And so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, what does that mean? That is now where the, the fear of the Lord comes in. That's what it means, to walk in a, in a manner that is worthy of God. We'll also discuss what that means or what it does not mean. If you don't understand what it means, then I will flip to the other side and show you what it does not mean so you can understand how you should walk in a, in a way that is, in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen. 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 So, knowledge, uh, not all knowledge is good, right? Let's, let me take you back to the Garden of Eden. I believe everything starts and it will end in the Garden. What happened in the Garden? What, what, did, well, what caused the fall? Do you guys know? The tree? The tree of knowledge. Just say it again. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's not the tree of knowledge. Get it right. It's not the tree of knowledge. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? So um, if we read it, let's, let's flip to Genesis. Genesis at the beginning. The very first book. It's, yeah. it's gents. Let's, let's, let's not see girls anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not girls. It's a gents. Yeah, life, no? <laughs> sure, there's no rewind. Oh, my. So I won't be invited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what happened here. Uh, let's start with chapter three. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. Stay with me. This is this is all connected, okay? With the fear of the Lord and you know and the servant spirit and knowledge. Please stay with me. The servant, serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say in his, you know, slithery, slimy voice or whatever, you shall not eat of any tree of the, in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the, of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw, pay attention right, to every word, okay? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of it, 
of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. So let's just imagine, just for a second, that we're watching this movie, we're watching this thing play out. So there, there's Adam and Eve living in the garden, and the Lord has told them not to eat of this tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. So I mean, if you live there, you see it on a regular basis. You walk past it because you're tending to the garden and you're tending to the business of the Lord. But you see it, but you have no desire to touch it. You don't touch it. You don't eat it. Nothing is happening at that time until the serpent comes to you and says to you that you won't die. And now all of a sudden it's desirable to you. Now you want to eat it. Why? What was Adam and Eve really being tempted to do here? It couldn't have been the fruit because they saw it all the time and it, it didn't entice them before. Why is it enticing them today? You know, that it was what I believe is, is what the fruit would do for them, you know, because the serpent was saying that it will put you on the same level as God. It will put you on the level where uh, you know what God knows, good, good and evil, you know. So what, what, what the real temptation was here was, was a life independent of the Lord, a life where you make your own decisions, where you know stuff. You don't need the Lord to tell you anything because you are on the same level. That, that was the temptation. That is what was desirable now at this time sure. to Eve or to his eyes and to even Adam who was there, mm. you know. So that is why I'm saying that not all knowledge is good. Yeah. But then if you look at, at, at what Solomon asked for, Solomon asked you on the service, he asked for the very same thing. He wanted to know to, if he would be able to discern between good and evil. That's what he asked for. Uh, when, when he prayed, when he was still young, when he, he just made king. On the surface, it looks the same. But what, what Solomon asked for was, if you read it carefully, he asked for the spirit of knowledge. He didn't ask for knowledge. He asked for the spirit of knowledge. So the, 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 therein lies the two differences. With the spirit of knowledge, you are under Holy Spirit. You are under God. You know, and with knowledge, which is what uh, Proverbs 7, Proverbs 1, 7 says, for the beginning, what does it say? No, I forgot, yeah? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Yeah. So all knowledge must start and end with the Lord. I'm just going to jump in here because that's also what I got. There's a difference between head knowledge versus spirit knowledge, right? And head knowledge comes from material things, okay? And that is when a lot of people can read some stuff, and I mean, we can all go and read some stuff somewhere, and then we can bring it as a sermon, and we can say, this is from the Lord. But is it really from the Lord if it comes from a material source? And that's the definition that I made about this, is that there is knowledge, and that there is revelation knowledge, or the spirit of knowledge, where it comes from the spirit of God. And the one definitely means that it is from a human source. Okay? And it often comes from human desires, if you get what I'm saying. So one of the things I wrote here is that revelation knowledge, or the knowledge that comes from the Spirit of God, is actually exact knowledge. It is the purest form of what knowledge should be. It is the purest form of understanding. It is the purest form of wisdom. It is all of that. But what do we do as people? We try to pull together all sorts of other straws and strings from our head and then we put it forward as knowledge. But it's come from many different material sources, if you understand what I'm saying. But the true revelation or the true knowledge that comes from the Lord only comes, as you say, by means of the spirit of knowledge. And I've also got a definition. I just, um, Danny, if you could just put up for me, please, um, Ephesians 3, 7, 17 to 19. Then we'll get back to, to what he is teaching on. Um, Ephesians 3, in fact, just give me verse 18. Um, I think it is. Right, it says, uh, okay, no, the next one is verse 19. And I just want to do a quick demonstration. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Okay, look at that scripture. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now in this regard, there is a difference between the two words, okay? The knowledge that has been spoken on here is the knowledge that you can understand. Mm -hmm. 
right? The knowledge that you can comprehend. But the knowledge of, of, of who Jesus is in the scripture is a different kind of knowing. And I went into the Greek to look at this. Um, and the, the Greek in the scripture comes from the word gnosko. And knowledge comes from the word gnosis, right? And gnosko actually means revelation. Right, so it's the purer form of even understanding the things of the love of God. And I wrote it that it's absolute. So the word know there actually means to know absolutely beyond human understanding the love of Jesus Christ. But now when I simplify that word knowledge to that second word knowledge, I've taken it a step further than just looking at it as, as head knowledge or material. I've taken it to the point of religion. Because people even bring in knowing the Lord in the form of religion. They try to simplify, they try to rationalize, they take from material sources, from books, from all sorts of things, what it means to know the Lord. Like I made a joke the other day, I said when people want to pray, they go buy a book on praying. Right? How do you pray better? But our first source should actually be from the Spirit who's giving us all fullness, who's giving us knowledge of prayer, who's giving us wisdom of prayer. So the true one that we should actually be focusing on is the, is, is the knowledge that comes from the Spirit of the Lord. Not from books, not from our own hearts, not from our own heads. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, are we done with the knowledge? Or can I just talk? <laughs> all right. Um, with the spirit of the fear of the Lord, um, it can be uh, like something that you, like you don't understand, you know. Okay, okay, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Is He gonna zap me if I do the wrong things, or you know what's happening there? But that's not what it means. This type of fear is not a, a fearful fear, if I mean, you know, for lack of a better word. Like I said before, it's it's a it's a it's living a life that is worthy of the Lord. So Romans Romans three. Verse 18. I'll start from 11. No, let me start from 9. It's only here one Bible turn. Sorry. Do you all have your Bibles? Thank you. Do we all have Bibles? Sorry, let me ask that. Do we all have? Who needs, Who needs a Bible? Raise your hand. You'll have one next week. One, two, three, four. Okay. All right. Okay. So from next week, we'll have pages moving and turning. Thank you. What then? Romans, you're a then. Romans is the one after it. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jew, Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive the venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruined, are ruined and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So, um, as you can see, that people who live without any fear of God get up to really no good, you know. So nothing is just like off limits to them. Sure. Their paths are ruined and, and, and it's miserable. Not just for them, but everyone else around them. Pastor now keeps talking about oil and grease. There's a difference between oil and grease. So we're talking about grease-filled people. So um, it first starts again as Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I looked at knowledge and I looked at uh, Isaiah 11 again to say, okay, you first start with knowing something, you get information, right? 
And then once you have the information, what do you do with it? Then you need understanding. You need to understand what it is that's in front of you. Once you understand, then you need wisdom. You need to know what to do with this information, right? And once you know how to or apply it uh, by, through using wisdom, that's how now you walk a life or live a life that is worthy. So it sounded to me, and I spoke to Noms about it, that it sounds like it actually starts with knowledge. You must know, then you understand, then you apply wisdom, and then you walk. But then Proverbs says uh, it first starts with, with the fear of the Lord. You know, so it's like this, so I was like, hmm, how does it work like that, you know? How do I, is it like this or is it like that? Is it knowledge first or is it the fear of the Lord first? Proverbs says it's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So I looked at different ver uh, versions of this verse. So uh, NLT, it's a new, new Living Translation, puts it very nicely. Even the children's version put it very nicely for me. It says, what does it say? <laughs> yeah, please get it from the NLT, uh, Proverbs 1 7. It will answer for me. Um, yeah, I was actually looking at the same thing while you're getting that one. Psalm 111, verse 10. Can Daniel gave me that one? Just give me verse 10, please. Because I was also thinking about the same thing. Because I saw at several points the connection between the spirit of knowledge and, and, and here it says, the fear of the Lord, this is Psalm 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, all of his precepts have good understanding to him belongs to your praise. So in my humble opinion, the fear of the Lord is actually the one that goes first, because the fear of the Lord, I believe, will create a desire for wisdom, for understanding, for counsel of the Lord, to move in the might of the Lord and so on. So we're not saying that these things are have one answer to it, we're just showing the different um, possibilities um, of how the Lord wants us to interchange the different manifestations of the Spirit. Right, you can go with you. Yes. Yeah, it says the fear of the Lord is, is the foundation of true knowledge. Yeah, I thought that was, that kind of simplified it for me, you know, when it just hit home. Also, um, this verse that Danny had put up, Psalm uh, 111, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, which can only be found through the Spirit. I just want to add on to that. I did my research, you know, it's a little bit different, clearly, from, from the teacher. Mine is a bit more fear of the Lord. That sounds scary. Yes, it should be scary. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually got that the spirit, the fear of, the spirit of the fear of the Lord is the spirit of reverence. Okay? And what does it mean when, when reverence comes upon the people? It means that things change. It means that things were rowdy things were disorderly, and then all of a sudden things get a little quiet. Because to fear the Lord means to revere the Lord. What does it mean to revere the Lord? It means to be in awe of the Lord. What does it mean to be in awe of the Lord? It means to be amazed by the Lord. So I believe that when the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes upon people or comes upon a house, things change. There's a different kind of anointing that falls. And that anointing that falls often brings discipline. Listen carefully now. The spirit of reverence, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, when that falls, often brings a different anointing, and that anointing often brings discipline. And I'll demonstrate this to you by some of the tongues messages that have fallen on this house. Sometimes it's a tongues message that falls, we all go quiet, but you can hear by the tone of it that it's uplifting, right? And you can hear by the tone of it that this is going to be something encouraging. But then there's that one that happens every now and again. And when that tongue's message comes on the house, you quiet and you hear there's a diff different kind of authority that falls and you know that there's a rebuke behind that tongue's message. You know what I'm talking about? Have you all experienced that? And that is for me the easiest understanding of when the spirit of the fear of the Lord calls. And usually a tongue's message like that will be something like, you need to get your lives in order, you need to pray you need to be more steadfast. You need to put aside this foolishness or whatever. And sometimes, like what happened maybe a few minutes earlier when I was talking about leadership, that could actually also be traced back to the fear of the Lord. 
because the Lord is saying that we need to get back into that place of order and that place of discipline. We've forgotten how to do things properly. And that is when the spirit of reverence or the spirit of the fear of the Lord falls. And how do we know this? If you turn with me to Acts 5, 1 to 11. Acts 5, 1 to 11. Now this is a story that people, please note it was a real story. It actually, actually happened from the book of Acts, right? But not a very nice story because there was death involved. Right, listen to this. Now a man named Ananias together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Now this is at the time when people were selling their stuff to give to the works of the apostles. They were selling their stuff to live together to support each other, right? With his wife's full knowledge, knowledge, spirit knowledge or head knowledge? We don't know, let's see. Full, a wife said full of knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. Do you think he was led by the spirit of knowledge to keep that money for himself? No. So he looked at the material element, like I said in my, in my evaluation of it, the spirit of, not, uh, of the head knowledge was about material gain. It was about assuming certain things. It wasn't about what consulting with the Lord. You see, when you, are, when you marginalize the spirit of knowledge, you also assume a lot. You assume that certain things are okay. You assume that you're allowed to do certain things. You, you, you go and you act and you do all kinds of crazy things. But that is because you are marginalizing. You are pushing aside the role of the spirit of knowledge. Some of you may uh, act on certain uh, whims and fancies and act on certain emotions. And I say to you, have you checked with the Lord? In other words, have you checked with the Holy Spirit? And the answer usually is no. But anyway, let's read what happens when you go on head knowledge. He kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so fooled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? You see, Spirit spoke to Peter immediately, and Peter discerned that this man marginalized the role of the Holy Spirit. Right? You're getting nervous. You should, because the spirit of the fear of the Lord is coming. Amen? <laughs> Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. And that's what happens when we, when we move in head knowledge. We rationalize even to the Lord. We start lying even to the Lord about why we're doing or not doing certain things. But as we've established, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord goes together. We cannot move in one and say, the Lord told me this. The Lord told me to do that. The Lord told me not to go to church, but rather to pray at home. The Lord told me ABC. I saw buena. The spirit of the fear of the Lord is coming. What made you care? When an I said this, he fell down and he died. <laughs> I'll read that again. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. What happened? He tried to put forth to the apostles as a form of truth what he had worked out in his own head as he had knowledge. We put the spirit aside, but oh, when the spirit shows up. Oh, when the spirit shows up. Say it with me when the spirit shows up. When the spirit shows up, people can die. <laughs> people can die people. If, you mark, if you mark if you mark the spirit of the Lord you might not die in body but you can certainly die in soul you can be tormented with all sorts of funny things you can be restless you can be agitated you can be anxious you can be emotional you can be angry you can be all sorts of things that is because there's no place in the same temple for spirits, big spirits, and small spirits. Amen. Big knowledge and small knowledge. Amen. And he died. A great fear sees all who had heard what had happened. What fear was that? The fear of the Lord. Were the people afraid because Ananias died? No, people die all the time. People died because of the lesson. I mean, people were fearful because of the lesson that came upon them. And all came upon them. A reverence of what? Of the power of God came upon them. What they saw was not that a man died. What they saw was the power of the Lord. Can I get an amen? Yes. Yes. What they saw was the power of the Lord. And as the power of the Lord hit, a fear came upon them that made them bow their heads in reverence of the Lord. And I can tell you what this generation needs more of the spirit of the fear of the Lord moving. Yes. 
because we have lost our reverence. We have lost our awe of the Lord. We, when the power of the Lord is moving in this place, people are rustling around, filing through chairs, busy on their cell phones, making jokes, but the power of the Lord is active here. During ministry time, the Lord is moving in power and we decide, no, we're going to accept. We're going to go outside and do whatever it is we do when we're there. What has happened to the fear of the Lord? What has happened to us moving in partnership with the spirit of the fear of the Lord? Have we become so full of ourselves that we've marginalized even that manifestation of Holy Spirit? Why? Because we are meant to be in reverence of the Lord. Because when you are in reverence with the Lord, you get knowledge. When you are in reverence with the Lord, you get wisdom. When you are in reverence with the Lord, you get counsel. When you are in reverence with the Lord, you get understanding. People come in here late sometimes and they make a big noise while the Lord is moving in power. That's not me you're disrespecting. That's the spirit of the Lord is moving in power that you're disrespecting. During the message, if you get up and march up and down and do all sorts of funny things, I don't mind. Like I said, I'm like you a recovering sinner. Amen. But what I do mind is that the spirit of the Lord is disrespected. And this is what happens when the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes upon the people. They know that they are meant to live here. They are meant to be all oh, the things that you're talking about. This is Almighty God moving through the place. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. The young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. No mess, no fuss. Amen. Move on. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing. Not knowing. Of course she didn't know. Because she was busy in the head with all sorts of other things. She didn't get the knowing of the spirit of knowing. The spirit of revelation that would have come upon her. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, tell me the price you and Ananias got for the land. And she lied. Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? How could you agree? Why? Because the spirit of the Lord is the spirit that moves in power. Remember, we established that the spirit of the Lord is the one that can actually pick you up and take you places. And the very same spirit of the Lord is the one that can strike you down. It's not about me as Peter. Yes? It's not about me as Peter. I don't want you to sing for me. I don't want you to be quiet for me. I don't want you to put away your cell phones for a few hours for me. Stop getting up and walking up and down for me, please. Who am I? And like Peter said, it's not for me. It's for the Spirit of the Lord that is moving in this place. How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. And then the young men came in finding her dead and carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Next one, please. Great fear. Great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about these events. Fear as in I'm afraid. No, not fear as in afraid. Fear as in I am in awe of God. Because of the power of God, because of the Spirit of the Lord moving power. Why do you think it's, it's a very Pentecostal thing when somebody starts speaking in tongues? We know that. We know when that tongues message comes, everyone goes quiet, even the instrument starts, because we respect when the Lord is speaking. But that's as far as it goes. Many of us have left our respect there, our reverence of the Lord, we've left it there. It's fine for us to come in late. It's fine for us to make a noise. It's fine for us to be busy on our phones and be in and out and in and out. Like I said, please, this is not about me. This is not about the band. This is not about the person preaching. This is about honoring and respecting and revering Holy Spirit. Yes. For this manifestation, this is one-seventh of who Holy Spirit is. I'll say it again. This is one-seventh of who Holy Spirit is. Holy Spirit yes heals holy spirit yes brings wisdom but holy spirit also demands that we fear the lord Amen. holy spirit also demands that we are in reverence we are in awe of the lord amen, amen. amen. see i told you mine was scarier than peace <laughs> one peter five five to six i'm not sure if i gave you that one danny but please give it to me as well one peter five five to six Young men, young women, young people, in the same way be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves in humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand. 
under God's mighty hand. That is something that you should be in awe of. You should be in awe of God's hand. You should be in awe of the might. In other words, you should be in awe of the spirit of the Lord. Why? Because the spirit of the Lord is also the spirit of might. Which means that when he's talking about God's mighty hand, he's actually talking about Holy Spirit. Yes. And what is he saying here? He's saying that when we submit ourselves to the Lord, humility will be produced. In other words, when we forget about our pride, I want to send a text message now. I want to send a WhatsApp. I am going outside now. I am going to be late. I am going to whatever it is that you've told yourself you're going to do. You will not be lifted up in due time. You will not be lifted up in due time if you do not humble yourself to the power of God. You will not be lifted up in due time if you do not just respect the two hours, three hours, four hours, all day long, if we are here for all day long, when the Spirit of the Lord is moving. Amen. If you cannot sit in your seat and acknowledge the awesome power of God, then you will stay where you are at. Greasy. Greasy. And not moving in the anointing. You see, when the Lord lifts you up, he doesn't just lift you up into different positions. He lifts you up to the throne. He lifts you up closer to where he is at. And as such, you are then able to receive more of him because of the closeness. So the spirit of the Lord is a bit scary, but not in scary as in afraid because it demands respect of who God is. Now I want to close with this. Do you have anything else to say? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just um, also a response on... On, on the spirit of the fear of the Lord from Isaiah when in chapter Danny can you just put this up I know I didn't give you any any verses uh, Isaiah 6 start from 1 we'll just look at what what Isaiah's response was to the spirit of, of the Lord in the year that King Ozia died I saw the Lord seated on the throne high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphets, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. So now do you see what his response was? Was woe to me. You know, so he he was humble enough and the fear of the Lord took over at this point in time when he said, Woe to me. And he and I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. Because now this forced him to have a look at himself and, and to and to repent. So it calls us to a, a place of repentance. Because he now he looked at himself and he said, I'm not clean. Even where I come from, you know, and I live among people of unclean lips, so I'm unclean. Where I come from is unclean. And, I, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So right now, at this time, when the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes upon you, our, our, our reaction to it should be one of, of repentance. Mm -hmm. To say, Lord, I repent from wanting to take control of my own life, wanting my own understanding to go forward, my own knowledge, my own counsel, you know, my own might, my own fruits of whatever I'm producing. I want that to go before. I, I, I didn't listen to the spirit. I didn't listen to the spirit of counsel. I listened to my own counsel. I didn't listen to the spirit of mind that did my own things. You know, just like when Adam and Eve were tempted to be on the same level as God, they took that. They found it desirable. And it, so many times we can say, okay, Adam and Eve were dumb. But how many times, or how often do we do that? You know, how often do we uh, make a decision outside of the spirit of counsel? Sure. Yeah. It's true. It's really good. And once again, we can take it to other areas of our lives too. The gender or just obedience that comes from moving in partnership with the Holy Spirit. I'm thinking now of examples whereby, you know, the word of the Lord goes out and say, if you're sick in stomach, come to the front. You've got a stomach, you should come to the front. Yeah. And then people will first delay, and they'll fiddle, and they'll decide, and they'll negotiate. If we fear the Lord, and if we fear the power of the Lord, we'll run to the front. Yeah. 
That's how it should work. And I didn't understand Apostle Maldonado. I always looked at him and I watch him, been watching him lately, and I actually got nervous sometimes because like there was this thing we were watching last week, and he's got he called his ministers up. He wasn't ministering over the people. And he, he called his ministers up, all his leaders and stuff, and he said, Okay, prophesy over the people. And they started laying hands. He said, I didn't say lay hands, I said prophesy. It wasn't about Apostle Maldonado. The Spirit of the Lord gave direction to him to tell the ministers to prophesy. And out of not fearing the Lord, now we decide we're going to lay hands. If I say people who have, have he suffering with headaches come up, and then someone with a stomach ache comes up, how does that work? The Spirit of the Lord said there's anointing for headaches. Are you going to go outside of that and rebel against the Spirit of the Lord? We're supposed to be in fear of the Lord. Fear of the awesomeness of the Lord. Fear of the awesome power of the Lord. Not doing, as you say, what we want to do. And this is the problem with this generation. I mean, in my closing, I just want to give you Revelations 5, 6. When, when I started the series, I started off looking at, at all the scriptures in Revelations where the seven spirits of God before the throne of God are mentioned. And I, I stopped short of, of reading this to the full. Then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been saying, standing in the center of the throne in circle by four living creatures. Remember in session one, we spoke at length about the seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. But I stopped here, which are sent out into all the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The seven spirits of God, right now as we speak, are moving over the earth. Why? Because the seven spirits of God are manifest inside of you. The seven spirits of God are manifesting in different, in different ways as the Lord commands. So to close off the series, there is no reason for any of you to say, I don't know what to do, I'm confused. I don't have counsel. I don't have wisdom. I don't understand this. You see, the spirit of knowledge, one of the things I wrote, the spirit of knowledge is a teacher. And the spirit of knowledge will teach you the scriptures, for example. So if you're sitting down and reading scriptures from knowledge, as in small k, as in human knowledge, obviously you won't get anywhere. But why should you struggle when the spirit of the Lord is moving across the earth? Why should you sit there not understanding the scriptures when the spirit of knowledge who teaches you about the scriptures is available to you? Why should you sit with lack of wisdom, making stupid decisions, when the spirit of wisdom is available to you? Why should we struggle in all kinds of things when the spirit of the Lord is available to move in power and authority? This week when we're evangelizing, why should we fear? The spirit of counsel will direct you. The seven spirits of God have been sent out to the earth. Sent out to just look pretty, no. Sent out to be accessed. Sent out to be utilized by the sons of God. A gift to the sons of God. Amen. 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 So as such, there's access. It is access what is freely available to us in the form of the manifestations of Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.